The things that I think are important to know about sweet potatoes, the ones that people oftentimes don't know, is their, their curing and storage temperatures. They're probably, and the fact that you can eat the greens. Those are the kind of things that are like not commonly known. Um, and the importance of curing, not just to bring sweetness in, but to build store, storage ability because the corking over occurs. You're gonna have all kinds of nicks and wounds. They can be broken in half. If you cure them right, those things will keep as well as one that was never damaged, or almost as well, you know? Um, and so those are the big things. I mean, I think a lot of this is like, sweet potatoes are probably one of the best crops to grow for ease, productivity, and nutrition. They just, they rock, you know, incredibly. Um, but we'll take it from the top and get to those parts. But I just wanted to say that this one here really was aimed at people who weren't familiar with sweet potatoes. If you've all grown them, I don't know how much new stuff I'm going to teach you tonight, but we'll, we always can get into the fine details, which are fascinating and apply to many things. So we'll find some good stuff to talk about. All right, so varieties. I'm really a slacker here on the heirlooms because I'm in the production. There's a huge array of wonderful heirlooms, and we indeed have 50-some different heirlooms out there that we got from Yana Fishman. If you want to get into heirlooms, Yana Fishman, Doug Elliott's wife, is very kind about giving them to people. She often has way too many in late spring or early summer, which is a little late for planting them, but they work fine. I got them in after July 10th, which is usually considered the drop dead date, and they look like they're gonna produce some sweet potatoes. You know, I just, I never say die. You know, I just couldn't get, I didn't wanna to drive to Old Fort, or near Old Fort where she lives, so I had to find a time I could hook up with someone. I finally found a time, planted them the very next day, made sure I irrigated them and they're looking good. And there's just countless varieties of different colors and stuff like that. And the product production will be terrible. They went in late and they're not big producers anyways. Why I don't grow the heirlooms, why you probably don't grow the heirlooms, Andrew, is because they taste great, they look great, they produce like crap, you know? Or people have just never seen them before, they can't recognize them. Can't recognize them, don't get them, yeah. You know. Like how many sweet potatoes per plant when you say bad? No, oh, no, there's usually just about as many sweet potatoes, they're just like way smaller, oh, you know? Okay. Like that's a, that's a, what variety is that? This I think is an old Beauregard. Yeah, Beauregard is just you know, Yana will say Beauregard. They the, the people around her call them they're the taking the market potatoes. In other words, you don't grow them to eat them; you grow them to take them to market because they do so well. But the thing is, you cure a Beauregard right, and it's absolutely delicious, you know. And that's you know that's always been my position. It's like I can't tell enough difference for the orange ones now. You want all the unusual whites and the purples and stuff, then the heirlooms are pretty fascinating. Are the goldens and all that, they're fun to get into. Do the whites still have like the lycopenes and all the stuff you get from the colors, I wonder? They don't have that kind of nutrition, but they still have loads of good nutrition, you know, but they're not gonna have like the vitamin A and you know, that kind of stuff. They're not gonna have the anthocyanins like the purples do and stuff like that. But they're still, sweet potatoes are amazing. You know, I actually did put down some of the nutritional stuff. I mean, if you grow the orange ones, you know, jumping around here, you can get five times the vitamin A you're supposed to. I guess it's probably possible that you could damage your liver if you ate too many sweet potatoes. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to eat a lot probably. You know, the classic one is juicing carrots. You know, people have actually hurt themselves doing that. You know, but um, five times the vitamin A, 60% of the vitamin D, 45% of the um, vitamin C, significant B vitamins, um, all kinds of minerals, lots of potassium, lots of phosphorus. Um, and then actually essential amino, amino acids too. So I mean, sweet potatoes are way up there for nutrition, way up there. And then the fact that you can eat the greens, I mean, you know, if hard times come, make sure you have a sweet potato seed stock, you know, because it's gonna feed the heck out of you. And then of course you can run your pigs over the field when you're done and they'll get the ones you missed, which you will miss them. Are we gonna yeah. discuss how to mix seed stock? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the things that I think is most useful you know, because that's not, not everybody does it, but it's really easy actually. Um, and you can get a lot of seed stock from a few sweet potatoes. If you start early enough, that's why I have it down to do six weeks out, because I wanna, I wanna let them make sprouts more than once. The same sweet potatoes will keep doing it, you know? Um, and actually, you can do them where you just like cut them and plant them, but if I have the time, I like to make starts, simply because it gives me really good control, you know? Um, but we, when we don't start them, we buy slips that have barely, barely any roots at all, and they do fine. And indeed, Yana Fishman has taught me that the, the scientists, the people she communicates, she grows over 40 different, she's preserving over 40 different varieties. You know, She's grown 900 pounds for her family 
in a year, you know. Um, she's a serious homesteader, you know. Not recently, I don't think. That's when her son was smaller, and that was his sweet. That was what she gave him as a treat, was sweet potatoes. Scientists told her that you really shouldn't t just break them off. You should cut them away from the sweet potato, and that helps to ensure you don't get diseases. That means you're leaving the roots behind. No big deal for sweet potatoes. They root so easy. I mean, you can stick them in the ground, they wilt down, and they come back, you know. It's pretty hard to kill a sweet potato slip, which is good news for people who sell them, right? <laughs> Real good news, you know. You usually don't get complaints, you know. You may get freakouts, but you just tell people to wait, you know, and then they pop. I mean, I've ever done that. Put them in. I remember one year I had them on fabric and it was hot and windy and the people that were interning with me didn't turn the irrigation on like I told them to. I walked out, everyone was wilted back to nothing. I thought I'd lost my entire crop, yeah. you know. A couple of days of watering, back up and growing, you know. They're really wonderfully resilient that way. They're, to me, they're, there's just no reason not, not to grow lots of sweet potatoes because you can just get so much production so easily, you know. They really rock. So varieties, the classic ones, you know, and there's many other varieties of Beauregard, but the two that I've grown are Covington and Diane, and they're just new versions of Beauregard. They're really productive, you know. An heirloom that's pretty productive and does well around here is Dr. Bradshaw's. Um, he's retired Clemson professor. There's almost always available at the um, CFSA conferences. And they're pretty productive. They do quite well, you know. Those are the orange ones. Um, I've grown Japanese. I've heard Mira, Murasaki is, is, good, is real good, too. There are two whites I like. I really like the whites a whole lot. I like the texture. They remind me of chestnuts, you know. And, and I've grown all kinds of whites that I've gotten from Yana, and I can't tell you the names of any of them. But they're all great. You know, I like them all. They just don't grow very I don't grow very many of them, but I don't really care because they're for me. You know, I'm not usually trying to sell whites, you know, or feed the hungry with them. The orange ones are great for that. They're just for us, you know, for treats. And they're really great that way. There are pale yellow ones that are also kind of dry. Really different from the moist, sweet oranges, orange ones. But really a blast. And then the purple ones are a whole new, wor whole new world, you know. Frankly, I don't know. Has anybody grown a purple that they're real excited about flavor-wise? Well, it's a purple skin but white flesh. So oh, that's a different now. They're also our purple-fleshed ones. Oh. Yeah. And they're, I mean, chefs, I will, some of those in the store. chefs will love those, you know. But frankly, to me, they're not huge in flavor. But they're powerhouses in nutrition because they're loaded with anthocyanins, which are incredible, um, you know, cancer-fighting antioxidants, you know. So they're good to grow that way, and they're just good to grow because they're so pretty, you know. Yeah. But it's not, I mean, flavor, I'm going to take the whites and the purples, and some of the gold ones, you know, are real nice for, nice for flavor. But the purples, I haven't found an exciting one yet. That doesn't mean it's not out there, you know. If you run into vole problems, just go to heavier soil, you know. That really is the solution. I mean, there's other things you can do. You can get a Jack Russell. Mm -hmm. When they're young and tough, they'll terrorize. They'll, they'll destroy some sweet potatoes, but they'll, they'll chase the voles off, you know. Um, you can get either plant skid pellets, which is simply blood, and it's organically allowed. It'll actually turn into nutrition, too. And that, that chases them away. And then another one is shake away, and you get that online at Critter Control. I'm less excited about, because plant skid is the product of industrial farming as far as it being a blood product. It's like beef and pig, pig blood. But the other one is um, the urine of bobcats and coyotes. And I don't think they're probably in the best situations when they're harvesting that urine, you know? It's probably not the nicest thing to do to bobcats and coyotes. It's very effective though. You do not use it. There's two ways it's, they recommend using it. One is to put it around the perimeter of your operation. Highly ineffective. First rain washes it away. You put it in every hole you see. You know, not a good plan for your scale. You know? <laughs> I would not recommend it. You know, um, I think probably scale just outgrows the voles. Even if you get damaged, you just don't notice it because, you know, you rotate your fields. I'm sure, right? Big time. Yeah, that's probably all you need for your scale. The voles just can't scale up to you. You probably hit damage and don't even find out about it. People just you know say, oh, you know, we lost you know five percent. I mean, it's just not going to matter. You know, um, but for smaller scale. You might want to use these if you're starting to have damage and can't find heavy ground. Heavy ground, that's the cast me out. It's going to be a problem, though, if you're selling them because ones that have all kinds of weird twists and stuff probably aren't going to sell well, you know. And, I mean, I'd say probably 10% of what we grow in this very heavy soil. The first year we put them in, everybody's like, these aren't even going to work. You have to prepare the soil way better than this. I said, the problem with our preparing the soil is we're getting them eaten, you know. We've got all kinds of gorgeous soil. They were just getting eaten like crazy. We had to stop growing them there. We got a great yield. I mean, we did have some weird ones. You know, they just did these little loops and stuff and then went forward or, 
but it doesn't matter. They still tasted great, and the hungry aren't going to care. You know, we're eating them ourselves, we're giving them to the hungry. So it wasn't a problem, you know. Um, I really don't ever want to overdo nutrition. I've done it, and I've gotten way too much top growth. And I got yield, but I had to kind of keep row cover on them and stuff to keep them going longer. Yeah. Basically now we get um, source from John Nielsen. That's the biochar, 50% biochar compost mix. We just put a small amount of that in, in each hole, and that's all we really do. We've done all kinds of nutrition, nutritional mixes in the past with like, you know, alfalfa meal and stuff like that. And just didn't feel we needed it, you know. The source has done fine for us. It wasn't really even source when we did it last year. It was just, we got it 50-50 right from John. This year we actually are getting the product, which is a little different because it's got rock dust, paramagnetic rock dust, and um, worm castings. So it's probably even a little more potent, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's all we've done. I mean, I, we, two years in a row we had really bad take because of lots of rain and stuff and we were just were having problems. Both those years we came in with compost tea and I think that made a difference. You know, I think we wouldn't have done as well if we hadn't. But I would avoid giving compost tea with nutrition until late in the season. I'd want them to be actually starting to make roots before I fed them. You know, I don't want to encourage that vegetative growth. I want the root growth. Once they're making roots, they're not going to change their mode. They're going to make roots. I mean, unless you go crazy, you go crazy with the nitrogen, you'll make them You'll switch them out of it, you know. But if it's just a little bit, that that'll work fine, you know. Um, we did do compost tea without um, without any fish emulsion added, just to kind of try, try to soften the soil up the first year because it was like basically we were planting in blocks of clay, you know. Not there was no soil; it was all in blocks. <laughs> you know, we had to kind of break it up to cover them, and we still got a crop, you know. And no vole damage, you know. Did it help break up the soil? Like Jerusalem artichokes will do that. The soil's getting better, which I'm scared about. I want some bad soil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to improve at least an area because we've been hammered by voles. That's been our problem, you know. And I don't really want to buy these things, you know, that you use for them, you know. So weeds. This year, confession, we haven't managed our weeds at all. We had a plan to use equipment, and between rains and problems with equipment, they got away from us. The best we did was come in with a weed eater and knock the grasses back to the foliage again. We've already dug. Our potatoes are not that big. They're about this big, about that long. But they're consistently that way. That's fine. No weed management at all. Tons of grasses. Doesn't matter. They're still producing, you know. I have decided that for the scale that we do on this operation, now when we get into the new farm, which is going to be 30 acres, it's going to have to be cultivation, and that's normally what you do. But for this scale, I used to use fabric. I want to use fabric again. It works like a charm, you know. And I used to make holes in fabric. I don't do that anymore. I would line up a row of fabric, plant the sweet potatoes along it, take another piece of fabric in and pull it right next to it, and then let them grow over it. And boy, there is no trouble. You get gorgeous sweet potatoes, um, no weeds. They produce like crazy because they have no competition. They love the heat, you know. To me, it rocks. I had to do that in Silo to get a good crop because it's so cool there, you know. So I just learned to do it, and I got over the holes real quickly. The weeds come up through the holes. You just pull the pieces, pieces together and leave nothing showing, and you've got no problem. The tape goes right down the middle, right where the um, plants are, and you plant next to the tape, you know. We would turn the water on. We had one foot spacing. Once the water turned on, it left a little spot. We'd turn it off. We'd come in, we'd plant right where that spot was, you know. You don't want to overdo irrigation with tomatoes, potatoes. They can handle some drought. They'll really perform like crazy if you do like a max of two inches, you know. But you can get away with one. If you're having to skimp someplace, sweet potatoes is, okay, is an okay place to skimp. They're not really, you know, you probably have found that drought hasn't been a big problem. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, they're really, I mean, sweet potatoes are amazing. You know, they're an incredible crop. That really is what I recommend for that. If you're, if you're going to plant a large scale one, are you doing no-till? Are you growing crop, crops and knocking them down and planting through them? Not yet. Uh-huh. Oh. That, that's the future, I think, you know. Uh, are you going to talk about when to eat the greens? Because I know they're edible and I know even have recipes, but I don't know when to pick them in, in the spring when they're young or, I mean. They can, the growing tips anytime. Oh, okay. Just don't get carried away, you know. I mean, if you want a crop, you know, maybe oh, you just decide, okay. Sense. Yeah, right, you know, I mean, you know, just harvest the growing tips, you know, and then. It'd be kind of hard to keep up with them. It'd be kind of hard to keep up with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they grow like crazy. So, I mean, you'd have to get carried away, I think, to cause much of a problem. So, you know? 
How does it taste different from spinach? They don't. I don't. I don't think they taste like spinach. I mean, I don't. Think, I don't think they're way flavorful. You know, they're just. You know, I've heard. It, my experience is people compare any mild green with spinach because it's hard to grow spinach in the summer. You know, my common joke is that um, the British had their empire, but they couldn't have their spinach, so they named a million other plants spinach. You know, none of which have anything to do with spinach. You know, right? Malabar spinach, New Zealand spinach. You know, um, all kinds of spinaches and sweet potatoes are another thing that you know. I just I like to mix those kind of greens. I like to mix things like sweet potatoes, Malabar spinach, and um, cow peas together. And then the qualities of them all, when they're put together, is a pretty satisfying green. You know, I'm I'm a real green junkie. I got to have my greens. So I just if I if we don't have you know, and we kind of at a certain point we decide okay the, the brassicas are getting too many harlequin bugs. We're not going to let them build up, and we take the brassicas out. You know, in Silo I didn't have to do that. It was cool enough. But down here. Some point in the summer, we go brassica free for at least probably five weeks to six weeks. This year it was so cool, we didn't have to do that, you know. And also, the, the harlequin bugs were knocked way back by the cold this winter. So now we've got a problem back there. We have to really go back this week and spray heavily with soap and flail mower because finally the, the harlequin bugs have, have exploded. Not in this garden, but we rotate. We, ro we, have, we have two, feet, two um, big yards behind some houses just down the road. And we grow our summer brassicas back there, and our fall brassicas, we grow more of them in the fall in the main garden here. So far, still no harlequin bugs in this garden this year, and that's because of the winter. That's nothing we did. I'd like to pretend, oh, we're doing something. I mean, we've, because of the rotation, we've really put a, a hurt on the harlequin bugs, but not that much of a hurt, you know. But um, so at that point, that's when I start eating these greens. Otherwise, I tend not to bother. I like my, you know, I like my collards and my kale you know, and my chard, you know, but when it's too hot for them, then these are the greens that I go to. You know? And we're hoping, by the way, to bring in, if we can get them to come, he's, there are a couple of people who I really admire because they don't want to give any time to the, to the developed world. They're just too busy with, the, with the, you know, the third world. And David Kennedy is one of them. He wrote a book that was mailed to me called 21st Century Greens. And it's all about how we can greatly increase the nutrition of people who are not malnourished by getting them to eat greens, you know, including powdering the leaves and you know, making pow powders and stuff like that. It's a really wonderful book. And when we asked him to come, he said, well, I really wrote that for Third World. People in this country aren't going to be. I said, they'll be interested in Asheville. He said, they're not going to be interested. I said, in Asheville, they'll be interested. They will. Well, think about it. You've got sog paneer, in, or any kind of sog, which is a spinach, all mm -hmm. kinds of greens dish, mm -hmm. a curry from India. Mm -hmm. And um, I mix any kind of green in the garden in there. Mm -hmm. You want to predominantly put something mild, but mm -hmm. I put arugula, I put anything that's green in the garden mm -hmm. goes in there. And um, I mean, that's served at the finest restaurants in Asheville. Right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's definitely a market for, for all kinds of odd greens here. Like Stan yeah. Copeta, the, the Greek spinach pies and the Middle Eastern spinach mm -hmm. pies. You could put any kinds of greens in them, too. Yeah. They're all covered up by eggs. And right. By the time you're done with everything else you've yeah. done, <laughs> you're not going to know the difference. Yeah. You know? And so that's how I've used sweet potatoes. I haven't really tried to become a gourmet cook with sweet potatoes. You know, they're just. When I'm out there foraging, you know, it's like, oh, I finished the day in the sweet potato field, sweet potato tips, because I'm going to come home, I'm going to cook something, I'm going to have some grain with it, you know, I'm going to do whatever kind of seasoning I want, you know, because I'm going to eat greens at least once a day, you know, that's just kind of a rule, you know. You can get sweet potatoes that will produce anywhere from 90 to 150 days. My solution is I never want to plant them before like at least the end of the first week, preferably into the second week of um, June. Because I got so much else going on, and they're going to work fine at that date, and I don't like them to get any cold. You know, sweet potatoes' enemy is cold. You know, that's their, if anything's going to hurt them, it's going to be cold. So I want the weather settled. Partly that's from being in Silo, where we've had frost in June. You know, here it's not nearly as severe. I'm sure we could put them in, in the first week of June. Did you say 90 to 150 days? Yeah, yeah they vary, they vary very wildly. You know, Beauregard is something like what I think they say 95 to 100 or something like that. You know, but there's. Some of the heirlooms can go 150 days. And my solution is, I don't, I basically, you know, I'm not in any hurry. Once again, I let them go until cold weather, you know. I thought we would have had them knocked down by the frost we just had. We got hit hard in the garden here with frost, but the sweet potato field didn't get hit, you know. And because of the grass and the competition, we'll let them go until we get hit. And there's a common mountain's tail, which I found not to be true. And if you found it to be true, I'd love to hear it, which is that if you let them frost, the sweet potatoes won't keep. My experience is if I cure them well, they'll keep. 
But I think what, what they're really saying is that if you let them frost and it's a couple nights of frost and you don't dig them after that first frost, the second night you no longer have the leaves covering that ground and keeping it from getting cold. And then the second night your soil is probably going to go below 50 where they are. And going below 50 will make sweet potatoes not keep. You want to keep them above 50 if at all possible. That, that, frankly, even that I've had happen and they still kept. But, you know, from the, from the research, from what Jan has experienced and stuff, I've heard tell that you can have problems if you let them go below 50. You know, so that is, I think, probably more what's important is get them out of the ground before your soil temperature, where they are in the soil, you know, they're not very deep, before it goes below 50. That's probably best practice, you know. And that's what we'll do. The first, you know, as soon as they get nipped with frost, we'll say, okay, they're coming out. And this year, because we have animals grazing in that field, I'm tempted to say it's almost certainly going to frost tonight. Let the animals go in there and clean them up, you know, take the tops off, you know. Um, and then we'll harvest them, you know. Diseases, actually, I had a whole little list of diseases, and um, I have actually a bunch of diseases on the computer. Has anybody had diseases? Do you want to talk about diseases? I've never had any diseases, you know. Um, there's a bunch of them you can get. You've got that little bit of damage there. I mean, I think that could be wireworms. We can go on the computer and look at it more. There's a bunch of pests that can happen. Wireworm and flea beetles, I've seen damage. Japanese beetles, I've seen a little bit of damage. Japanese beetles can also, as the grubs, can attack the, um, the, the tubers. But the thing is, the cycle's off, you know, because the, the sweet potato you got to be very unlucky. You have to have very early maturing sweet potatoes for those grubs to attack them because they're mostly up in the air when these guys are um, growing as plants, right? And so they're not going to damage the plant, the, the plant you put in. And then their eggs, when you're harvesting these, they're going to be tiny little things. They get bigger in the, as, as the season goes on. I just don't see how much damage you're going to get for them. I think that may be a problem more with the warmer climate where they've got more several generations or something. But I don't see them as a problem here, you know. And if you have flea beetle problems, um, I think the solution for sweet potatoes that's going to be easiest for most people is simply to be give them a little bit of food and help them outgrow them, you know. Because they're going to, you know, all flea beetles, I think, you outgrow them easily, you know. Yeah. And flea beetles are too big to eat the eggplant. And see, they're different flea beetles, you know. <laughs> right. they're not, it's a sweet potato flea beetle. It's gonna, and so they also say that they're in the refuse around the garden, you know. They're all... It's not like you've got a flea beetle that attacks brassicas, eggplant, and sweet potatoes. They're specific to the plants, you know. Um, so anything you do to control your sweet, your, um, sweet potato flea beetle will do nothing for your eggplant, you know. It'll do nothing for your brassicas, you know. Um, many, okay, another solution if you have serious problems would be to spray them with surround, you know. That'd probably be more than enough to solve the problem, you know. I just don't think it's going to be a very big problem in this climate, you know. Other climates, very different story, and I probably should go grab the computer, look at the various insects and diseases, speculate what I do with them. It sounds like the worst one, but it's mostly in Africa, is Altenaria. Altenaria can be a real problem. I've had Altenaria be a real, and it's not, once again, it's not, Altenaria that attacks sweet potatoes is not going to be the Altenaria that attacks other things. They're, they tend to be real specific, you know. But they tend to be very similar in how they're a problem, you know. And what's hard about Altenaria is that it's in the soil. So rotation is going to be real important, you know, and it might be a situation where mulching would really help, you know, and actually to go back to no-till, I think it is the future because it'll save us, it's going to build the soil, and I think you could save a lot of tillage, you know, because once you have good sweet potato coverage, they're going to pretty much exclude other weeds, you know, with a few exceptions, you know, bind weeds can compete because it has the same mode, you know, and you'll get a, an occasional big pig weed or something, but once because if you can have, you know, um, a lot of residue that you roll down or somehow kill, and then you can plant through with the no-till planter, there's going to be very little weed growth until well into the season. As they start to rot off, by that time you should have really good coverage from your sweet potatoes. And I think that's what we'll be trying, you know. So our report, you know, I don't know if we'll get to try it next year, but by the year after, we'll do that. We're working with Ray Archuleta. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's with USDA, and he's into like multiple species of cover crops. So you get really heavy residue because you're growing all different kinds. You know, right now I think our mix is like Boston winter peas, um, per, um, crimson clover. I think there's another clover in there, and 
at least two grains. I think it's barley and wheat, you know, but it's at least four species. And then for summer, cover crops will be growing even more than that. But that for sweet potatoes, we'd be using the winter, winter residue. You know, there's probably rye in there too, because it's late enough in the season that you can kill it for sure. You know, rye is an iffy one for early in the season because it's hard to kill. You were going to ask I just thought of something. Um, when I harvest these tomorrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, then I just take the greens I can chop and drop. I mean, are the greens at this point, you think, too tough to eat? The tips are always going to be fine. The tips are always good. Okay. Yeah. So the rest of them, can I just chop and drop? Right? Totally can. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely. Yeah, it's going to be great stuff for the soil. And then if I put in Austrian winter peas right now in that bed, will they have time to spread? Let's say if we're going to have our first frost in a week. You, tomorrow is the last day the, the extension says is a good time to plant. I know. So you're going to be fine, okay. you know, because of course I break that rule all the time. You know? yeah. <laughs> I just keep planting cover crops until they're in, you know, and if a new place opens up, I plant them, you know. And they, I mean, some years, once in a while, we have a really brutal winter and they don't do much till spring. But then they still, they're sitting there, they take off and they come on big time in the spring, you know. And if, you, if you're not going to work that soil till May, you still have good coverage. One year, we had acquired property that we were going to rent and we didn't get it till February. And I said, let's put a cover crop in. And we have a conventional farmer now becoming an organic farmer working with us. And he just was coming out to help with the work and said, this is way too late to put cover crop in. I said, well, we don't want the soil bare, we'll see. And sure enough, we didn't, we ended up not using that field. Um, the, the, the deal went through, went through or something, but that field in May was glorious in cover crop, totally thick in cover crop. We put it out in February, you know? So it's just never too late to put cover crops out. They don't cost that much. And the advantage is so much soil protection. So, and it, I mean, indeed, then that would have been a perfect field for putting sweet potatoes in. They would have been, they would have been a late cover crop. They would have been lush as can be. If we had a roller and rolled those, it'd be perfect for putting sweet potatoes in. You know, I'd actually recommend you not dig tomorrow. It's too wet. Yeah, I think it's gonna be too hard, but I'd plant the cover crop. Okay. I'd sow the cover crop. I'd chop the greens up. I'd sow first and then chop up. If you have, are you gonna chop it with a mower of some kind? No, hand. Okay, well then maybe you'd, you wouldn't do that. See, we have mowers. So we sow our cover crop and then we come through and we flail mow and it throws all this residue on top and it nurses the cover crop, right. you know? But I'd sow and then you'll disturb some of your cover crop where you're digging, so I'd re-sow. But I, I would have sowed a lot earlier, actually. That's a strategy I recommend. Is it's totally covered with greens. I mean, it's just wall to wall. I haven't had to weed a thing. Yeah, so even then I would have sown because they're gonna drop down through and start sprouting. You may have to sow again, but you'll get a nurse crop, crop growing and they'll be like, why'd you put me here? There's no light, right. you know? But you sow them sometime, you know, maybe for that, well, that thick, I'd sow maybe a week before I harvest. So you've got germination already, you know. Yeah. Then you take your cover crop down. Then you see how good your take is. Probably not that good, but, that, but you come back. But the beginning ones will really nurse the other ones. And you'll get some, some rapid growth early, you know. And for situations where they're not as thick, you may get a good stand, you know. Um, and that's just because, like, like you're doing, you're going to let them go as long as you can. So now your cover crop is late. So you just sow your cover crop early and at least it started, even though it's not going to do very well. As soon as you release it, it's going to take off, you know? One of my favorite things to do with these guys and other root crops is to grate them up and make a non-potato latka, make a root crop latka. It's a spectacular dish, you know? Really a wonderful dish, you know? You can make a gourmet dish if you make a, um, a sauce, a white sauce that you put um, tomato in. Tomato paste works good because you don't want a whole lot, but a couple tablespoons of tomato paste or maybe a little bit more of sauce or maybe fresh tomatoes. Red wine, bay leaf, and marjoram. It just works perfect on these, you know, and you can serve them as a main course, you know. Um, it works really well. Um, and that's not my recipe, by the way. The name of that recipe is Sauce Aurora and it's in Vegetarian Epicure. So if you want the exact specifics, it's in that, you know. I've like used that for like, um, Seal community has like things where if somebody's sick or if they've had a kid or if there's an illness, in the, if there's a death in the family or something, we make meals for people. That's my go-to, I'll make a meal when I don't have time and they'll feel like they had a treat and they always ask for the recipe, you know. They always ask for the recipe. And it can be any mix of roots, but sweet potatoes are always a perfect one to go in there. How many vodkas can you get out of a sweet potato? Well, if you're just using sweet potatoes, I'd say probably you'd get, I mean, we're talking size too. I tend to make them about this big. 
and I'm going to guess that that's going to be maybe a cup and a half grated or two cups. Is that maybe two? So that's probably going to give you five to six, I guess. You know, of that size. You know, so it's a great way to use them. You know, and then you can add carrots. You can add and any root, any root. You know, any root beets. You know, um, they totally rock that way. You know, and also by the way, I come home. I want that kind of nutrition. I don't want to wait to bake a sweet potato. I grate them up and I stir fry them. And they're great, you know. Stir fried sweet potatoes are actually very delicious, you know. So there's lots of different ways to use them. Um, and to me, if you are looking for nutrition and want to eat healthy and don't have time, your grater is your friend. If you're a farmer, your grater is your friend. I come in at night, I want lots of roots and stuff in a hurry. I grate them up and cook them, you know. It's just a way to eat fast, you know. Um, which usually I want to do. <laughs> By the time I'm eating, it's like time for food. You can buy slips. Andrew right here is a great source for organic slips. What's your minimum? What's the least you'll sell? Twelve. Twelve. That's a pretty small minimum. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a darn good minimum. Give it a shot. Yeah. Um, Twelve. Yeah. Twenty-four or uh, forty-eight. If somebody buys 12 potato, sweet potato slips, how many sweet potatoes would they reasonably be able to expect to grow? Any um, idea? I'll appeal to Pat. We usually predict about five to seven tubers per hill or per mm -hmm. plant. Um, you know, and like seven or eight would be a good yield per plant. Mm -hmm. Seven or eight roots. So that's a lot of food for someone who's got a small space, mm -hmm. you know. Well. So True Seed also sells sweet potato slips. Choi's Greenhouse is a great regional source in Burnsville. He mostly gets them grown by locals. locals. You know, he's, he's great too because he has a lot of heirlooms. You know, he always has Beauregard and stuff, but he's got these ones, a family one from his family that's one of his cousins grows that's been in Tennessee forever, a white one, you know, and just this whole array of different ones. So he's fun to get them from that way, you know. Um, and then I think most of the feed and seeds carry them. What, what's good about Troy's? And what's your season? How long do you offer them for? Uh, we're going to do one big date next year, one uh -huh. big ship date yeah. um, on June 1st. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's kind of right in your sweet spot that you were yeah. talking about. Yeah, right. Um, Troy's, what's good about him is he'll still, he can still get you, to, get you them in late, late June, early July. You know, he just keeps them coming as long as people want them. He's got people who just have beds of them. They're just pulling them as people want them, you know. So you can just keep, keep getting them, you know. And so that's just... Because not everybody's going to hit the, the, can plan for that way, so then there's another way to get them, you know. But you can grow them yourself so easily, you know. They really, um, it, but it takes planning, that's it. You've got to start them well back, you know, because the, the plant's got to be, you know, go from dormancy to sprouting. Once they're sprouting, they're going to make pretty, uh, quite a few sweet potatoes starts pretty quickly, but the dormancy breaking can take a while, you know. If you save them till August, boy, have they broken dormancy. You know? <laughs> we could have had so many slips from what was left from last year, you know. But by that time, it's the wrong time to plant them, you know. You can grow them for greens, but that's about it, you know. So I usually say six to eight weeks back, I want to start them so that I'm sure they're coming in big time, you know. Um, and you can get many harvests from the same sweet potato. If you, ta if you take all those slips off, they're just going to make more, you know. By the way, you can also reproduce from growing some early plants and just taking the tips, cutting the tips off and putting them in water, and they'll reproduce from that too. The, they, they reproduce vegetatively just about any way you want, you know? Yeah, you could, you could start a couple now and grow them in-house as house plants and then cut pieces off them and grow them, you know? There's just numerous ways to produce from them, you know? But the classic way is to put them in um, sand or sawdust and put them in a warm place. I've ever started them on top of my compost pile, but I make sure there's a good straw barrier between it so I don't get ammonia coming up and stuff. That's a good warm place. I've got a germination chamber. If you wanted to get wet, we could walk down there and look at it, you know. It's essentially um, a metal drawer with a hole placed in it to put a hot water heater element and then a thermostat from um, uh, Granger that's got a, a remote bulb that we stick in the chamber, but in the air, not in the water. And then we set it at 70, 72 degrees for plants. I'd probably set it more like 80 for sweet potatoes. When the air temperature does, goes below 80, it turns the water on so that the water gets hot enough to turn the air into that temperature. So it's got lots of humidity, which sweet potatoes don't mind at all, you know. 
plenty of warmth, and they pop really fast in there, you know. Once they're popping, I take it out of there, I'm afraid it's going to cause rot, you know, and then I put them in a, maybe on a heat table or something like that to get them to keep coming. They don't need, once they're popping, they don't need nearly as much heat. 75 to 80 is going to be fine. They're going to give you plenty of sweet potatoes that then way. Then you take the, the sprouts off of them, right? And yeah. then you stick them in water and just let them... I actually like to stick them in plugs myself. Stick that way, plug. in plug. I just do them in, in um, uh, 70, 72s. I think the one, usually we do everything 128s, but 128s awful small for a sweet potato start, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I like 72s, and that way I've got total control. I put them out, they don't miss a beat, they take off, you know. That's a neat idea. Yeah, you know, it, it really works, you know, and if you've got a planter, then it's, gonna, it's perfect. You can plant them real easy, you know. Yeah. Um, but I guess you have probably figured out how to do, I have never done a planter for slips. Do you do a planters for slips? You must, right? Yeah, they get really big. Uh -huh. They get really big. Huh. The thing is, if you're going to be doing what the scientists say, you will actually cut them above the roots because the roots are going to be touching the sweet potato. And that's scary, but it really is better for disease. They do fine, too. They, they, they root in like three days. Yeah. You can look and see. There's it's like, incredible, yeah. They just keep them kind of moist. And yeah. They may lay down. They may drop the leaves that are on there, but they'll come right back up. Yeah. They're, I mean, that is so easy to do. The really great thing, too, is, is that's a way to get varieties that's hard to get, you know? I mean, that's the main reason that I put this, you know, 50 plants or 100 plants. It was 100 plants out because I wanted to have a big mix of ones, that, you know, so we'll taste the ones and see which ones we like. We'll save a couple of each, you know. We, won't, we didn't grow enough to really eat lots of them, but we'll find out which ones we like, you know, and then we'll reproduce those ourselves. You know what would be a cool thing to do around here is sweet potato tastings. Well, we're going to actually do that with winter, we just bought a bunch of winter squash from Baker Creek Seed. All, I, I can show you downstairs, there's all these amazing different shapes and colors. They're all vine borer resistant, they're all machadas and mixtas. And on November 15th, we're having our celebration event. We're going to demo how to make some things and stuff. And we're going to do flights of winter squash. Oh, cool. And I'm thinking about to do flights of sweet potatoes. The problem is I don't have them named. So they're going to be unnamed, but we can still say these are the ones we like, and then we'll save them and reproduce them. And maybe I can get Yana to help me name them. She said, Pat, I can give you a lot if I don't have to label them. I said, don't label them, I'll take them. You know? <laughs> you know? She said, it's going to be a lot harder if I have to label them. You know? So I just took them unnamed this time, you know. But then we'll decide which ones we like, and I'll say, Yana, it's a yellow, it's a, you know, and you say, well, does it look like this? And maybe I can help figure them out that <laughs> way, you know. Um, backward engineer it, you know. Yeah. And get less next year, and then compare and see which ones they are, you know. So we might just do flights of sweet potatoes, too, nice. you know. Um, I love that idea of just having all, you know, having to sit down and, and judge them and write them off, you know. I've done many with Yana. She loves that sweet, because she just wants to know what people think of them, you know. Um, so yeah, I think we'll be doing sweet potato tastings, and then we'll save a couple of each and reproduce them, you know, and multiply them, and then we'll start to have, you know. But we're never going to grow those to feed the hungry. I mean, they're just, they're just not as productive by a country mile, you know. I mean, you get about the same number, they're just not nearly as big, you know. And so that's okay, you grow those, you know. We, what we might do actually is provide them to, to people to grow for themselves, you know, grow plants, you know. I mean, that is actually my dream is to, at some point, stop feeding the hungry and start teaching the hungry how to grow. You know, that is really what I want to see happen. You know, we haven't even begun to talk to the food banks about that. And um, have you ever tried to grow one of these indoors over the winter? Yeah, as a house plant, they'll okay. do fine. I mean, you're going to have the same old aphid problems you have with all house plants and stuff. You know. But do you get uh, tubers? No, no, you don't grow them for tubers. You grow them for greens. Yeah. Right. You know. I mean, I you might get a tuber. I mean, you know, but it's not going to be very big. Try. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know. The thing about doing that is you then have, can get early production and then you can root those and have all kinds of plants, you know. I mean, because if you hang it up, I mean, it'll make a lot of, you know. And just about any, you know, a piece of sweet potato vine, you can root it, you know. It's just, it's all, they vegetatively reproduce incredibly easily, you know. So that's another way to do it, you know. Well, the way that they propagate the sweet potatoes is extraordinary. I mean, they start out with like 700 mother plants. They're all micro, you know, virus indexed. Mm -hmm. And they turn those 700 plants into like well over a million. Yeah. Just by growing them, cutting them, then doing it again. And they've got the infrastructure. Yeah, they're that mass. I mean, they really are one of those plants that assure us that if we just pay attention to having a, a way to grow, we will never go hungry, you know. Um, and they're just, 
I mean, we know the nutrition. It's amazing. I mean, they're, they're one of the most nutritious things you can grow. You know. Um, when when you decide to talk about harvesting, I have a question of how to get the temperatures, the hot temp, the warm temperatures. All right. We're yeah. we're going to talk about that for okay. sure. To me, that's probably one of the most important reasons to have this class. That's the biggest challenge for small growers. You have, I'm sure, built a space for curing your sweet potatoes, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and did you buy commercial stuff or just make your own? Um, it's actually, it's been made for a while longer than we've been around. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so you just took over a curing house. Yeah, we worked directly with that. Then that is where I was gonna go next to me. Well, we've, already, we've talked about harvest, but let's, go, let's be sure that that's all covered. You can decide at any time. If you dig your sweet potatoes and you like the size of them, and you like the count, doesn't matter when you harvest them, it's fine. Just cure them, you know, um, and they're fine to dig. You know, it's not like you gotta wait till cold weather or something. They're not gonna get sweeter by that. They get sweeter by good curing, you know. You can also push it like we're gonna do this year because we've had grass competition. So they're gonna stay in until, you know, the cold says the, 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 vi the vines are gonna die and then we'll harvest them, you know. If I pick this yesterday and I need it now, it's not gonna be as sweet as it should? Well, you know, that's not for sure. I've had people not cure them at all and they're as sweet as can be. Oh, okay. But I've had plenty of people who came and said, my sweet potatoes aren't sweet, and I'd say, cure them, and then they are sweet, you know? But sometimes you luck out and they're cured, they, they're sweet anyways, you know? It's not like, you know, for sure they won't be sweet, but if you want to be sure they are sweet, and even more importantly, if you want them to keep, then you want to cure them, you know? Because it is about corking, about getting that gray, corky, any wound and stuff, they can rot if you don't get that corking, you know? And it's incredible. I mean, if you're harvesting the way we do, we, we use a um, potato plow, we break a bunch. And we just cure those and they keep fine. You know, I mean, we try and eat them first, but we could be eating them in January and they're still keeping fine. You know, um, so to me, the corking is, is probably even more important because if you let them store long enough, they'll become sweet anyways. I mean, as long as they're not in a cold place, which they shouldn't be anyway, you know. I can't get my house above 65. That's warm enough for sweet potatoes, you know? You'd have to wait many weeks before they sweetened up if they were, you know, but they will eventually. My understanding, and I've had it happen when I didn't want to bother, you know, and I didn't care if they were sweet, and then eventually they started getting sweet, you know? It just takes a lot longer, you know? 65 is a, is a little warm for storing them. I mean, I, I think they'll keep better if you keep them someplace between 55 and 60. Okay. But below 55 is actually not good, you know? Um, below 50 is bad, but they're even better if they're above 55. They like it a little more, you know. Yeah, eventually, but for the first few days. For the first few days, actually it could be four days to two weeks. And I, I just check it by um, how, cor basically if they're corking well, they're usually going to be sweet enough too. Tell me exactly what you mean by corking. Corking is they get that gray, kind of hard, you know, and that's not going to spoil. You know, a wound that hasn't corked will spoil. But once you get that gray hard, that is actually like a tree, you know, makes its, its cured area, its, its healed over area, that's its scab and it's going to heal, heal fine, you know. So that usually is my, my indicator that they're probably cured. Then what I do is take a couple and bake them, you know. <laughs> and they're usually sweet as can be and then I know I'm done, you know. And it depends on your temperature and humidity, you know. Um, if you can actually hit 85 to 90 or something like that, then you're going to get them to cure pretty fast. How about those seedling grow mats? I got a bunch of those. Are they 80? They're not 85. Do they have a set temperature or do you have a... You just plug them in and they, they're warm enough supposedly. Uh-huh. I check the temp because you can probably also insulate them yeah. to create more heat, you know? Like a temp. Yeah, yeah, you know? Okay. And I'd also say you can save energy if you put them in, a, if you create a solar thing outside and then just turn them on at night but then insulate it so the cold doesn't cause you problems, you know? In the daytime you can probably hit your temperature easily if you're home, are you home in the daytime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you could probably, you know, get that 85 without any electricity on the sunny days. Right. The problem around here, if you rely on just a greenhouse, is that you have days like this, you know? And that is going to greatly lengthen. And pretty soon we'll have days like this when the temps are in the 40s. That's problematic, you know? Um, years when I had nothing, I cured them in my car. But I was hauling them in at night, you know? <laughs> it was kind of a pain, you know? Oh. That's what I want to ask you. It's just, when I haul them in, I've got such amazing soil that, oh well, it's just stuck. This black stuff is stuck all over them. Can I um, hose them down? It's not recommended, you know. I mean, but people do. I mean, that's the great thing about rules. You can break them, you know. Okay. So maybe you hose down the ones you're going to eat in the first few months, but you don't hose down the ones you want to have last a real long time, okay. you know. 
and then you get the best of both worlds. You know, you probably have to wash them to sell them, right? Uh, we don't wash them. You don't wash them. Getting cured. Uh -huh. um, you know, really. You don't brush them, or not? Not with water. But yeah. do you just use a vegetable brush ever? Around? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's that's okay as long as they don't get too clean. Yeah. 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 I mean, that really is probably the best not to wash them. But if you want to. You know? Well, I was going to put it in the car to bring it here. It was just like... Oh, yeah, sure. No, no. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I understand why you wouldn't want to put it in the car that way, you know. But um, a lot of root crops do better not being washed. You know, burdock, they say, won't keep it all if you wash it. I've washed it and had to keep, but, you know, not for months and months, you know. Yeah. Um, but like I say, you can break the rule. Just don't count on them being your longest lasting ones. You know, if you're going to eat them by January or something, they're not going to spoil, you know. But then the ones you want to have the last where you're eating them in April or May, then maybe you don't wash those, you know. You might try an air compressor too, if you got access to one, you know. You know, blowing them off, that might get them clean in a hurry, you know. Um, but yeah, the dirt's not going to hurt them. They're going to cure better if they don't get, you know, that. If you're digging them by hand, you can oftentimes, you know, spot, it's really nice to get them when you still know where the vine is because you can know exactly where to dig. Mm -hmm. And that's really nice. Do you guys use a potato plow, I assume? Yeah. Yeah. I do them by hand with a little um, soft fork. Uh huh. So you don't break a single one or hurt a single one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Have you considered doing like a a broad fork? Yeah, a broad fork. That would be a good all idea. the way down in there and then just kind of. They come right up. You'll break an occasional one that way, though. You know. You will. Yeah, but not. It depends on your soil. In our clay soil, we break them. If it's a soft soil, you might not. You know. But it, it doesn't really matter if you break them because they still cure. You just eat them earlier. That's all. They'll last fine. It's not really a problem. I mean, they're incredibly good at keeping if you cure them properly, you know. So let's go to how to cure them. Like I said, the, the most basic ones are you put them in a warm place, take them in at night, you know, or insulate it, you know. With Greg Gross, my friend Greg Gross and I are actually going to do a hands-on workshop at the um, Carolina Farm Stewardship, Con Stu Stewardship Association Sustainable Ag Conference in various ideas for making structures to cure, you know. Mm -hmm. And Greg was into, like, we'll just get a thermostatically controlled heater and we'll just figure out how it works. I'm like, you know, let's also buy a thermostat and buy a humidistat and show that you can spend maybe 150 bucks or something and have a catalog system, catalog system that you're going to use for years. You can set that system up to cure sweet potatoes, squash, onions, garlic, you know, and for some you're going to use humidity, for some you're not. But if you can control that humidity perfectly, you're just going to get a great cure. And so you might drop 200 bucks. Over 10 years, that's 20 bucks a year. Over 20 years, that's 10 bucks a year, you know. So it just depends on your resources, you know. You could also share it with people, you know. Um, that's always my dream is that we'll share these kind of resources. You know, people can bring it to your place and cure them and maybe pay you a little fee each year, like 10 bucks a year. Within 10 years, you'll pay off your thing or something, you know, or five years, depending on how many people you do it with, you know. But we also, I went to the Goodwill and picked up a heater for four bucks. You know, and I don't think it's going to burn the house down. It seems to be in good shape. And that's just a way to say you can do this cheap or you can do it, you know. We're going to, we can buy a humidifier to create the humidity. We can just have a little humidity gauge and turn it on and off manually. But we might also buy one and hook it up to a humidistat, you know. And so then structures, it could be a closet you have or some kind of structure you have already. Or you can also make simply a tunnel, you know. And actually, Greg's made his living in construction, so he's got that job. He's supposed to look up, and we'll put it online when we teach the class. But you can get concrete covers. They're basically row cover with a foam backing, and they're designed to cure concrete. And I know about them because Tom Elmore, who grows commercial tomatoes, covers his greenhouse with it. And I'm probably misquoting him. I probably don't have the exact words. But he said something like, when I cover my greenhouse every day, I'm making $99 an hour because of the heat he saves by using this lightweight but still insulative cover over his like 30 by 100 foot greenhouse, you know. And so you could use that also over sweet potatoes. And the name of that material? It's, it's called, I think, concrete cover, okay. you know, and it's used to, to put over concrete when they're curing it in cold weather. Because, you know, concrete gives a little heat off and that much insulation will work uh, to a certain degree, you know. To me, that's a, that's a major tool, <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, um, and if you don't want to research it, Greg's going to have it researched by the time we do this at conference, which isn't that far away. You know, the problem with doing a, a solar heated outside house, or even one that you heat, if you use a tunnel, is it's going to be really cold outside. It's going to cost you in electricity 
or cold shock to your potatoes at nighttime when it gets cold. But if you have this concrete cover, not going to be a problem. A little bit of heat is going to go a long way and you're going to keep going, you know? And I'd pull that cover over as the heat peaks. As you feel, and the way I tell that, it's the same way I cover my vegetables with row cover in the cold weather. When I no longer am warmed by the sun in the afternoon, it's time to cover. Because that means you're no longer gaining, you're going to start losing. You know, as long as you're getting radiant gain, when you feel the sun and it warms you and you're directly in it, you're still gaining. As soon as you're not feeling that, then it's time to cover. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to trap that heat and you're not going to need a whole lot of backup heat to pull it through. And yes, the mats will do. There are heat tapes that you can use. You know, I always prefer the ones that you set the temperature because then you can get it up higher. But if it's one that just gives you a temperature but you leave it on all the time, then insulation will create the heat. But you have to watch it and not get it too hot. You can damage, damage these guys if you go too hot, you know? And so that's the, you know, the other side of it, you know? Other systems that you can use, you can make a solar heater that, you know, collects heat and then it goes up into a cabinet, you know? We have a small version of that downstairs I can show you. Greta in Ohio made a big one, like a big cabinet with a solar collector and it just works on the, on the principle of heat rising. But if you do that, I recommend you have a thermostatically controlled small electric heat source where the heat should be rising from because of days like today. The problem with solar heat is we live in a climate where it rains all the time. You know, and on those days, you're going backwards. You're not getting what you want. But if you, have, if you set that kind of thing up, that's the kind of system that's going to concentrate heat. You're not going to take a lot of electricity because you're going to be guiding it to a narrow thing up into a place where it's going to really rise. And if you insulate that and control it well, you'll get a lot of heat. And you can also, by the way, probably get the humidity simply through covering. But you want to have, if you want to hit it right, you want a humidistat. You know, you want to have a, something that tells you what that, what that temperature is. And you can pick those up any number of places. They have the digital ones for not much money. They have the re remote bulb digital ones, so you can stick it in the thing and read it on the outside, you know. But if you've got heat and you cover your sweet potatoes which have moisture, you're probably going to get your humidity without having to pr provide it, you know. But I'm thinking, I want boxes of them, you know. I want to be curing boxes of them. And that's going to be harder to be sure of. So I'm going to probably use some kind of humidifier, you know, something that gives me humidity and then have a, a plug-in electronic way that I plug it in and it gets turned off whenever that humidity gets to a certain temperature. And you can get those from Granger. Greg went online today and checked them. You know, there's two different, two different versions. They're both under 100 bucks, you know, so you can easily set one up, you know. For the final storage, 55 to 60 degrees, do you want um, humid or non-humid? You want more humid than the average wood heated house, but it doesn't have to be up there in the, um, in the 80s, you know. If you're over 60 or something, you'll be fine, okay. you know. But the truth is, we stored them under our beds in, um, in Silo, you know, because it'd be 55, and um, our, our house was wood heated, and we struggled to keep that temperature, that, that humidity above 50, you know. A big, shallow sheet pan that we kept water in all the time we could usually keep it above 50 if we were heating, you know? And in the dark. It gets humid in the bathroom, you can just... Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's ways to do it, you know? Well, I've got one of those humidifiers they buy for children who have congestion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I use it for my house plants, but mm -hmm. that would work if I tented it, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll definitely work, you know? Um, there's, you know, it's just creativity you know, about doing that, but it's way worth doing it. You're going to get much better keep and the sweetness is going to come on a lot faster. It's way satisfying, you know. And by the way, you want to do very similar for winter squash, you know. Okay. Um, they'll last longer too. And things like butternut will get sweet a lot faster. Butternut will eventually get sweeter as it stores, but you can speed that up a whole lot if you do that kind of curing. Just the 55 to 60, not the 80 to 90, you know. No, you want to do the 80 to 90. You'll cure a whole lot better and you want the humidity winter too. Winter squash? They do way, they, they cure better and they last longer and they sweeten up quicker. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not as widely known. Pumpkins and other stuff too? Well, pumpkins, do you really need pumpkins? To, I mean, you're either growing pumpkins for small ones for cooking. Yeah, that. But see, in America, 95% of all pumpkin is eaten between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Not a lot of storage issues, you know? Yeah. They're not that flavorful anyways, really. I wouldn't really bother curing pumpkins. You grow them before then, you want to store them well. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could cure those too. I tend not to cure pumpkins, you know. Um, they usually keep fine for me without curing, but I cure winter squash all the time, you know. And we have winter squash, you know, 
well into July and it's still keeping, you know. And when we don't cure them, which we didn't cure them well this year, we put them in the greenhouse rather than taking them to the kiln. And we got our coos jaws are starting to show rot signs already, you know. So curing to me is, is a way to ensure keeping. You know, if you got the facility, you know, and you're probably wanting to sell some early but keep a lot to sell later in the season, I'd cure the later ones, you know. Probably reduce your, your um, losses by quite a bit, you know. Deer. Is anybody having trouble with deer? They can eat your plants back to the nubs. Oh yeah, I know a lot of friends who are having The easiest dogs. solution? Get a dog, a big dog. Dog is a great solution, but your neighbors might not be happy about that, you know. It's got, <laughs> the deer won't like it, the neighbors might not either. By the way, you can accentuate the dog. If you have a dog, then I think it really does work to go to the local poodle shop and get the hair. You know, and actually, Will Schmidt, who was going to make it here tonight if it hadn't been raining so much, says he likes to get the hair from before they shampoo and after because it's stuff with the soap in it is a repellent too. Oh, yeah. you know? But it's way more effective if you release a dog once in a while. The deer are really smart. If they smell the dog all the time but never get chased by a dog, they'll eventually go, maybe there isn't a dog. You know? <laughs> so, but the easy solution for a small scale grower, put row cover over the sweet potatoes. They don't need pollination. They like the heat, you know. A groundhog will get through the row cover, but deer aren't going to go through the row cover, you know. So I've had years where I had bad deer pressure and I kept my sweet potatoes under row cover. All the, the downside of that is sweet potatoes have extra floral nectaries. So they're feeding your beneficial insects. If they're covered, you know, do you know about extra floral nectaries? Plants are way cool. They not only make nectar to bring bees in, they make nectar to get mostly hymenoptera wasp family to protect them from all kinds of pests. You know? One of the pests I saw that attacked sweet potatoes, and I'm sure they do here, we just have such good climates it's not enough damage to happen, but there's a thing called sweet potato hornworm. You know, it's like a tomato hornworm. You know, we just have enough growth that it doesn't matter. But if you have the extra floral nectaries, then the braconid wasps are going to come in, feed on those extra floral nectaries, and lay their eggs in all those potato hornworms sweet potato hornworms and it's going to solve the problem, you know. So we probably have all kinds of biocontrol of sweet potatoes we don't even know about because they're feeding the insects that need to protect them. But it's also a reason to interplant. If you are growing that way, growing sweet potatoes in among your other plants is creating new food sources for those because Baconid wasps are very weak flyers. They're such weak flyers that the genetics between the ones in this garden here and the ones three houses over are probably different. They prob How um, do you spell that name for the wasps? B-R-A-C-O-N-I-D. And it's, they are, I mean, they're just like one of our major controls. They're, if you see the little golden mummies of aphids, you never see the aphids that are, instead of being aphids, they're little golden balls, that's Braconid wasp. Mm -hmm. If you go out in the garden and see yellow cocoons or white cocoons on, on brassicas, those are Braconid wasp, and you'll see like a dried up dead worm, and then you'll see these eggs. I could, you know, if it wasn't so wet, I could go out there and show them to you. We have lots of them, you know, and they're, it's why you want to grow lots of farmscaping flowers to bring those controls in. And I get to tell this story again. I learned it from Richard McDonald. You got two Braconid wasp sisters, sisters, they hatch out, right, of the cocoon, and they fly off, and they go different ways, you know, and one flies and lands in a parking lot, and the other one flies and lands in our garden, right? And that one gets to feed before it mates, and the one in the parking lot doesn't get to feed before she mates. She's going to mate anyways, right? But the one in the parking lot's going to lay 30 eggs. The one in our garden that had a good meal is going to lay 300. And the ones that land in the parking lot, all of those hatching Bacona wasps are going to fly away and look for a place where there's food. The ones that land here are going to stay right here. They're going to feed on our flowers, so they're going to lay 300 eggs when they do it, and they're going to lay those eggs in our pest, you know? And so that's why we have major control of those kinds of pests. What are some of your favorite um, flowers? I know umbelliferous stuff like dill and um, cilantro. Fennel and cilantro. What, what else do you like to plant? I saw down there some, like, I thought it looked like cleome. And yep. Cleome. Um, cleome, actually, we grow mostly because it's a trap crop for um, harlequin bugs. We are thoroughly off topic, by the way, right now, but that's okay. It's all right. There's two of us. We've thoroughly covered sweet potatoes anyways. We can go off topic. 
Um, this time of year, we try to make sure we have bachelor button and, and, cal and um, calendula out there because they'll bloom in the cold weather. Cilantro is a spectacular one. You know, my joke about cilantro is that um, Johnny sells you know, the ones that bolt less quickly. And I've noticed they do bolt less quickly. I've timed it. They're at least 45 minutes, behi minutes behind the other ones. You know, <laughs> I joke, you know. I mean, they bolt so quickly it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, you know, it, yes, they, they, they don't bolt as quickly as the other ones, but not by enough that it matters. And that's a downside if you're wanting to harvest greens, but if you want them for, for beneficial insects, they're probably your fastest way to get farmscaping going. You, you can just scatter cilantro throughout your fields and they'll go, to, they'll go to seed and they'll be bringing the beneficial insects in big time. And then if somebody calls you up and says, hey, you got cilantro for sale, you almost always do because of course they also go to seed regularly. The green coriander is a chef's delight. They love it. They're just blown away by how aromatic it is. So you can really win a chef over with that green coriander. You know? So that's one. We like to grow lots of composites, everything from sunflowers. The one composite not to grow for beneficial insects is the one that everybody grows. Not Rebecca. No, marigolds. Oh. Everybody grows marigolds to keep bugs away. And the theory is that the marigolds smell bad and the bugs can't smell the food. A, I guess a bug that has eaten a lot and isn't hungry will not smell the food. But I've never seen cucumbers not be on, on cucumber, I mean cucumber beetles not be on cucumber plants because there was a marigold next to them. You know? It doesn't work. But they smell so bad that none of the insects feed on them. They're not a good nectary. You know? So I grow a, a few marigolds because they're pretty. But I don't grow them for beneficial insects. You know? I grow almost every other composite, Rudbeckia, um, echinacea, sunflowers, dahlias, zinnias, all of them will bring in way more insects than um, marigolds, you know. Anything, yeah. I've been holding two questions about sweet potatoes. Okay, yeah, go ahead and ask them. Get us back on topic. Well, Do it. <laughs> to, uh, could you go back and illustrate again what you do with the, um, the row sheet? The row cover? Yeah, I mean, the, not the row cover, the fabric. The fabric. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, sure. Um, this is actually credit to Diane, my partner. You know, she noticed, I mean, like me, she was really bothered that, you know, if you cut, if you don't burn, but rather cut the, um, the woven fabric, it falls apart, right? And it's just frustrating. There's all these strands around and stuff, and it doesn't fall apart that fast, but it's going to shorten the life. So she said, why cut it? Why not just, like, lay one piece down, plant next to it, and then take another piece and pull it right up to it and staple it so that there's no place weeds can grow. So that's what we do, you know. So we plant a row of sweet potatoes right along an edge of fabric. Then we roll another piece of fabric out right next to that, right, and we just staple them in. There's nothing but fabric. There's no weeds at all. You staple the fabric together. Staple the fabric together right around those sweet potato shoots, you know. And then there's no weeds at all. You are weedless, you know. And you have tons of heat. What do you have weighing down the fabric? Just staples, nothing but staples, you know. And pretty soon, sweet potato vines. You could pull the staples out, you know. And the vines are going to hold them down, you know. But, you know, do you use staples? Staples are the way to go. I mean, I, well, I guess sandbags are good, too. It depends on, you know, it's, you say potato, I say potato. They're both good. All right. Your staples are like this big. Yeah, staples are six inches long, okay. you know. You can get them. They're called ground. They're called ground cover staples. You know, the the cheapest place I know to get them. But see, on your scale, you should just buy a pallet of them. <laughs> yeah. But Parker Farm Supply on 19 is for some reason below 30. Everybody is over 30 dollars a thousand, and never buy them from the catalogs. Just assume that you can sell some to other people and stuff, because they'll charge you like 10 bucks for 60 or something like that, and you can get a thousand for 30. You know, it's just a so much better deal to buy them. You know, as a, bo a box full, and then when somebody says they need them, say, well, I'll sell you, you know, 10 for 30, <laughs> 60 for 30 for, for $5 or something, you know, what a deal, you're cheaper than that. Or, or you can just sell them for what they cost, which is, you know, very little if you're getting a thousand for. Um, do you plant into flat ground or do you make beds for the sweet potatoes? You know, I plant into flat ground because if I make beds, I'm making it easier for the voles, you know. Um, but I think if you don't have vole problems, I think they probably like that, you know. It's going to warm, it's going to be warmer and they like that heat, you know. It's probably going to be, when it gets cold, you're probably going to want to dig them a little sooner because that, you know, if you're raised out of the ground, you know. But I've had great production in the ground, you know. And indeed, 
I have a hiller that the person made to hill for sweet potatoes, but I've never used it because I don't need it, you know? So I don't bother with the hills. Um, it doesn't mean that I might get, you know, if I didn't have vol problems, I might get slightly better production. But we get great production. I mean, not, we're not all unhappy with our yields, you know? Could you go over sort of like the step-by-step -step planting of the sweet potato slip? Yeah, like sure. Are you breaking up the ground below um, where you're planting to make it a little easier for it to grow down? Or like, mm -hmm. just, yeah, what's going through your mind? Okay, well, I mean, I break it up mostly because the people I work with hate working in this horribly clumsy ground that we're working in. And we do that because of the voles. But actually, the sweet potatoes don't mind it. It's the people who plant who don't like it. So what we've taken to do is bringing a potato plow through, right, and making a row with the potato plow, you know. And then coming back, we have a power harrow on a walk behind. And we run that over it. And then we plant. Or we've also come through, we have a um, rotary plow. And instead of power harrowing where we put that, where we made that row with the potato plow, we come through with the, power, with the um, rotary plow and throw the soil from the path into. And that makes a slight hill, but it's not much. It's like, you know, if this is the soil, it's maybe that much above it, you know. And then there's a fair amount of softer in amongst these big clumps, you know. And that's how we plant, because we want the voles to be bothered by the big clumps, you know. I don't think the sweet potatoes really care, you know. To me, what's important, I found that if you plant too deep, they may not do well. I've had interns plant them so deep that they were, you know, I didn't have good, strong root. Um, you know, it was like too far down, and then they, a lot of them didn't come up from there, you know. So I think you can plant them too deep. And then the other mistake that people make all the time is not firming well. Anything you plant, you want to firm well, because the plants are counting on capillary action until they develop their root systems, you know. So that is probably the only two parameters. And then I like to water as soon as I can after I plant because they are going to be stressed, you know. And so we like to have the drip set up before we plant, you know. And then, like I say, what's great about that is you water, and it tells you where to plant, you know, because it makes yeah. a wet spot, and then you water right. You You're doing like it. a 12-inch spacing. Yeah, we, get, we have our, 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 our drip tape is on one foot, you know, and that works fine for us, you know, and you probably don't have drip tape, right? I've got a whole irrigation system that, that pecks to uh -huh. yeah, right. miles of it. And do you have spaces that, so you can use it for spacing? Because mm -hmm. I love that. I, you know, I, I love to use it for all kinds of spacing, you know. Mm. I don't like measuring, you know. And I like good spacing, you know. So. And we're not planning with a machine, though I think we'll go to that, you know. Um, once we get, you know, we're going to try and go to all mechanized, you know, and that's the plan. We got the 30 acres. I don't know if you've heard that story before, but we basically had extension agents out here from the southeast. And they said we were the best place they toured, and they should have spent the whole day there. But then they went to lunch and said to Janine, the problem is they don't hit the bottom line, so how can we tell our farmers to do it? So we're going to try and hit the bottom line on this farm, and then any money we make, put that back into the nonprofit. You know? And so we want to develop systems that are cost effective and do it on a scale that farmers who are using machinery can do. We also have six acres that we're going to do it on a small machinery scale, like just a walk behind. So we're going to do both, and that's all going to be at the new farm. This garden here is never meant to be at the bottom line. This is more what you would do if money no longer mattered, but being able to eat mattered. Those are the, that's the value here, you know, because you can't eat money, you know. And so if the day ever comes when, you know, money no longer matters but food does, I think the systems we use here will be the most powerful ones, you know. And that we're fortunate to have the support we have from the nonprofit to be able to do all three, you know. So yeah, are there more are there more sweet potato questions? Do we cover? What's your ideal size of sweet potato slip? A slip? I think that you know ideal is probably something like that, you know. Ten inches. Yeah, yeah. But does it really matter? I planted ones like this that did well, you know. Oh. They still did. They need a little more care, you know. But they're just tough, you know. I mean, yeah. they grow, you know. So. It, and if I do starts, I don't grow them 10, ten inches, you know. Are you always planting strictly vertically? No, I've laid them sideways, especially given our, the crevices, you know, yeah. the, the rocky canyons that we plant in. I find where the soft dirt is and fit them in there or whatever, and they do fine. As long as a fair amount of it's coming up out of the ground and the, the more solid stuff is in the ground and just interfacing at the, at the, you know, there's a little bit of solid where it comes out of the ground, then they seem to do fine. Cool. Yeah.
That's, you know, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, that's, you know, yeah. My vines root like every third or fourth node. Great. Is that good? Yeah, totally. Because, well, I was thinking if you have that cover, though, on your soil. Then they won't. But it doesn't make any difference in terms of yield. I've had great production without, without them doing that, yeah. Okay. But I see that as a downside of using the fabric. You know? and, and the vines get to be 20, 30 feet long. I mean, I, it's ruined. I, mean, it's, I can't walk the paths in my gardens anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's normal. Okay. That's healthy, you know. I mean, what's ironic is that we're getting a decent yield and our vines are pathetic because of all this grass comp competition. But we're, but we're not getting yield like that. I mean, our potatoes, if we get potatoes this big and that big, I'll be thrilled. You know, the last time we dug, they were more like this and that, you know. But we just totally blew the weed control, you know. We have 2,000 plants out there. We're not going to have a shortage of sweet potatoes, you know. But we could have had a way better yield. We have nothing in them, though. I mean, we got them in the ground. We didn't do another darn thing. We, we weed ate them once, you know, and that was it. Because we got behind. We couldn't do it. You know, we just, we didn't, we didn't manage it right. And so next year, I'm going to say, for this scale, let's use fabric. When we go to the field, then we'll develop the machinery, you know. We really aren't, we, we kind of want to use machinery where we are now, but we haven't really learned how to. So we just didn't have our, you know, our one cultivator in good enough shape, figured out well enough to do it. And by the time we finally got to where we could do it, we were getting out of that rainy time and it was never dry enough. So then it was like, well, let's get out there with hose. We couldn't get enough people to do it. We just kind of blew it, you know, which happens when you're growing, you know, we just didn't, we missed that one, you know. But the great thing is the sweet potatoes are still forgiving us. We're still getting a crop, you know. Um, but it's, a, it's so funny because you got 30 foot vines and we're lucky to have vines that long, but we're still getting a crop, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, they, just, they bear. I mean, they're just, they're an amazing plant, you know.